Thanks for joining me today. And uh, we're going to be talking about finding the number of ways to park in a tree. Now, this is based off of work that I did with Ron Graham and Catherine Yan. And uh, it's about parking functions. Or it's really a generalization of parking functions. So we're going to talk about what parking functions are, what does it mean to park in trees, and then how we can go about counting these things. Because they're not so easy to count, at least not so obvious how to count. So, well, let's begin. Now, our basic idea is we should think of there being a one-way street. And there's a variety of spots available to park. And in addition to this, we have a set of cars. So if I have five spots, I'd have five cars. Now, initially, I thought maybe I should do something fun, like have some Legos. Well, math departments can't afford Legos. We can barely afford paper and pencil. So instead, we're just going to use some little glass beads here to represent our car. So we have our five cars. Now, what's true is that every car has a preferred place where it wants to park. Now, you might say, well, what happens if it can't park in its preferred place? Maybe it goes to park and it's full. Well, that's all right. What it will do is it follows the one-way street. It's a law-abiding car. It follows the rules. And it'll look for a free spot. Now, if it finds a spot, it parks. If it hits the exit, then it's over. It gives up. It's not a very patient car. It's not going to come back and try a further spot. No, no. So if you hit the exit, you're done. A failure. Well, what's a success? Well, all the cars park. Okay, so let's try this. So I have five cars here. So what I should do is to write down a set of preferences, I just need to list five numbers, each one from one to five. So let's try this out. So I could have, say, one, three, three, four, five. Okay, that's five numbers. All right, so what happens? So the first car is going to come in and it heads to spot one. Success. The second car comes in and it heads to spot three. No problem. Now the next car comes in. It also wants to go to spot three. Ah, somebody's already there. So to spot four, done. All right, how about the next one? Goes to spot four. See, that's, that's where we're at. Nope, oh, somebody's already there. So to spot five we go. And the last car comes along and doesn't park. Failure. All right, so this is an example of something which is not a parking function. So we'll just sort of say, nope, that's a not a parking function. Well, let's try a different one. Okay, so we'll reset. We have to have a, a new set of preferences. Okay, how about something like uh, one, one, two, two, three. Okay, how does that go? Well, okay, we come in. One, success. Next one. One, ugh, somebody's there, but two's free. All right, how about the next one? Well, that's two. Nope, somebody's there. Move down, free. And, uh, of course, okay, now we're at two. Ah, nope, 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 ah, now we can park. And the last one, here we go, three, nope, four is not there, ah, but five is. Success. We made it. So, that is an example where we have a success. That's what we call a proper parking function. So anything where we can park all the cars, that's a parking function. Now, of course, it's easy to come up with a parking function. Namely, just give each car its own slot. One, two, three, four, five. Well, it's easy to see. No one's going to have a conflict because they all want different spots. So they'll all park. Okay. Now, a little bit of a note here. There, when we talk about parking functions, there's a couple of different variations. And one of the things that often comes up is the question of, do I care what order the cars prefer? For, so for example, I have one, two, three, four, five. Should I consider the following as the same or different? Namely, three, one, two, five, four. Notice that as a set of numbers, these would be the same. So in terms of saying, 
look, where are the set of preferences? These are considered the same. So if we were in the unordered setting, these would be duplicates. If we're in the ordered setting, where it says, well, it matters which car prefers which spot, these would be considered distinct. We're going to focus on the case where we don't care about the order. So for us, we're going to assume things are going to be weakly increasing. All right. So, so in other words, the numbers will always go up or stay the same. So this number, 3 to 1, that's going down. So that would not be one that we consider. All right. Well, that's the basic idea. Now, how do we get this a little bit more abstract? Because, of course, you know, that's one of the things we often do in mathematics is we take something and we make it a little bit more abstract. So we have our motivation. Well, one of the things we can do is, is represent our situation by a graph. Now, a graph is just a way to say, what are my objects and connections between objects? Now, my objects are my parking spots, one, two, three, four, five. My connections are going to be, well, which spot can I move to? So if I'm at a particular spot, what's the next spot I can reach? So, for instance, we say, aha, the graph that represents this, 1, the next spot I could reach if I can't go to 1 is 2, and then after that, the next spot I could reach is 3, and then the next spot I could reach is 4, and finally the last spot I could reach is 5, and then I would have to exit out. So. Oftentimes when we think about parking functions, we think of like, hey, there's this sort of operation happening here on a path. Now, that's the normal idea of parking functions. What does it mean to park on a tree? All right, well, we kind of have some good idea about what's happening here. You see, what's the key? The key is we always move towards the exit. Now, on a one-way street, there's, you know, pretty clear, so there's only one way to go. But of course, you might have two one-way streets merging together. You still have only one way to go if you, if you start anywhere. So you might have something a little bit more complicated that looks like the following picture. All right, so here we have one, two, three, four, five spots available. And again, we can ask ourselves the question, all right, what's going on? Well, we can still have preferences and ask, well, can a certain set of preferences succeed? Well, the answer is, of course, it depends on the structure. And, uh, well, let's try something. Do we know something easy that will work? Well, the answer is there's always one thing that's easy that will work, which is, suppose that we insist they all like different spots. Well, okay, guaranteed. No conflicts. That's going to work. So. We'll give that a good old check, indicating success. But what about other situations? Now, if you remember, a few moments ago, we said, well, for a path, we could do one, one, two, two, three. And that would work. Well, would it still work here? Let's, let's check. All right, so here we go. We have one, okay, that's fine. Then if we do one again, all right, Conflict, move to the next available spot. So we're just following the direction of the street. There we go. There was our next available spot. All right. So that's the one, one. Now two. Okay, where's that? The two is here. So there's two. Okay, we can park. Two again. Well, okay, come on. And we're entering here. So we get to two. Nope, follow the street. Nope, that's our next spot. Open. Oh, sorry, it's not open. And then five. Yes, we can park. Okay, and the last one, three. Well, where was three? Well, three was over here. That's three. We follow it, and we see exits. Doesn't park. So, it fails. So by changing the way that the streets come together, something that previously we could park becomes something we can't park. All right, good. So now we can ask similar questions. What can we say about our preferences? What kind of preferences lead to parking? And of course, we can also do our same abstraction. See, what do we do? Well, now what we do is we think about how do things connect together? So we start at any given spot 
You say, well, what's the next spot I could reach if I followed the directions of the street? So that's where we connect. That's our connection in our graph. So let's uh, uncover the number so we can follow along here. So we see if I start here at spot one, the next spot I could reach would be three. So I could say, well, there's a one and that can go to three. And similar, if I start at two, the next thing I can reach is three. So if there's a two, then the next thing I can reach is also three. Now, how about three? Well, the next spot I can reach is five. All right, so that goes to five. All right, anything else? Well, there's this spot down here. And where can that go? Well, that can go to five. So then I have one more piece and that connects to five. So what do we have? Well, now we see that there's this beautiful structure. What we would call this is we would call this a tree. Now, what's a tree? A tree is a graph where there's no cycles. We've oriented all the edges so that they all flow to somewhere. So one way we can think of this five here, we can think of this, well, this is sort of the last stop before we exit. But in terms of trees, we might also call this the root. So in other words, we move towards the root of the tree. All right, so now let's think about this for a second. How many different ways to choose preferences so that we can park in this tree? Okay, well, well, this is a good chance for you to pause for a second and try it out. So see if you can figure out how many different parking preferences, you could call them parking functions, are there so that all five of our cars can park. And I'll tell you the answer in just a second. All right, are you ready? Did you figure it out? Did you get 10? Oh, too low. It's not 10. It's actually a little bit more. So what is the answer? Well, it turns out that for this particular arrangement, there's 12 possible ways. And here's a list of all of them. So for instance, one, two, three, four, five. Well, we already knew about that one, but you could also have some more interesting and exotic ones like one, two, 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 four. All right, well, that's good. Now, this is a small tree, so you can do this some case analysis here. One easy thing to observe and we'll make this observation again a little bit later, is you notice these ones on the end. We would call these leaves. And what's true about a leaf? Well, the only way I can end up getting something parked there is I have to have a car want to park there. Because where are your two options to fill a spot? Either you desire that spot, some car does, or some car desired an earlier spot but got bumped down. When you're a leaf, there is no earlier spot. So the only way to get somebody to park there is to have somebody desire that spot. So we know for sure one, two, and four have to show up in our preferences. So that helps us narrow our search down. Uh, doesn't make it easy, but it makes it possible. Now, of course, this is just five vertices. You can imagine you get more complicated things and we won't have you try to do this at home. You could say, look, here's a, a tree on 30 vertices. I'm not going to label the indices, but you could see I'm heading towards this root. Well, there's all sorts of different possibilities here and connections. How many ways to do it? Well, 1 billion, 560 million, 690,000, 937. In other words, a lot. Now, how would you find that? Well, definitely you wouldn't want to do it by hand. It would take you very long. Even a computer, it's not so clear how to go about doing that. But of course, by the end, we'll have some nice ideas. That'll help us do this by computer relatively quickly. In fact, we can get to the point where we can do a tree on thousands of vertices in a relatively short amount of time. And then we get to numbers with hundreds of digits. So yeah, definitely we're not gonna count one by one. We're gonna need a, a better idea, a smarter idea. So our big question that we're going to start thinking about for the rest of our, our time together, how can we find these numbers on bigger trees? So let's take a second, step back. And let's think about what we did before. So in other words, what if we had just the path, the original setting? Well, 
for a path, what do we have? We have the following. We can say, well, well, look, I suppose I have one to two to three to four to five. Of course, there's nothing special about five. You can make any number you want. We can say a set of preferences will succeed if and only if the number of cars that want to park in the first I slot, so in other words, say one, two, three, for example, is at least I. So in other words, if I count how many cars want to park in one, two, and three, there's at least three cars that want to park there. Now, why is this true? Well, you can think about it. There's a couple of ways to, to view it. One is, well, suppose that it wasn't true. Suppose that only three cars wanted to park in, say, one through four. So one, two, three, four. There were only three cars that wanted to park there. Well, what does that mean? Well, only three cars can fill up four spots. You're going to have an empty spot. That means you can't succeed. But really, another way to think about it is just think about, okay, can I fill up all my spots? Well, how can I fill up spot one? It's a leaf. That means somebody has to prefer it. So we know at least one car has to prefer spot one. How about spot two? Is it true that somebody has to prefer spot two? And the answer, no. We don't have to have a car that prefers spot two because what can happen is someone can prefer spot one and then the next person can prefer spot one, which bumps to spot two. So we don't want to say that, oh, every spot is preferred. What we want to say is that collectively, between one and two, at least two cars want to park there, or maybe more than two. It's at least two. That's what we need. All right. Now, how does this help us count? Well, what we do is we transform our count into a different problem. This is a really good way to do counting problems, is to say, here's this one counting problem I'm trying to do, is there another, hopefully easier, kind of problem that I can do? And in this case, it says, hey, let's talk about lattice paths. So what's the lattice path? A lattice path says you're going to move in a grid, and you have two types of moves. You can either move straight up, or you can move straight to the right. All right, so what do we do? Well, the preferences are going to give our up steps. So if I have a car, for example, that prefers spot one, that means I'm going to have an up step where I have spot one corresponding. And that's true for every spot. So if I have three cars that prefer spot one, I'd have three up steps. Now, we can take this idea here and translate it into our grid. Now how? Well, remember, by the time I hit spot one, I have had to have at least one up step. So that says that my lattice, when I think about my lattice path, I have to be somewhere by the time I end going up in spot one in this portion there. Now, by the time I get to spot two, I'll have had to have taken at least two up steps. So if I've gone at least two up steps, I have to be somewhere in there. By three, I have had to have taken at least three up steps, and so forth and so on. And so, what do we end up with? Well, it says that my walk here has to be up on the top half. So this is the part where our lattice path has to occur. And in particular, it's a lattice path that stays above this line. Therefore, Nothing can happen below. Everything happens above. So we might have a, a preference. So let's just uh, make a lattice path up here. And here we go. There's an example of the lattice path going from corner to corner. What does this say? Well, it says two cars prefer spot one. So one, one. One car prefers spot two because see there's an up step on two. And two cars prefer spot three. And that's our preferences. And it works. It works. Everybody parks. Everybody's happy. And now, the nice thing is we know how to count these things. It turns out that the ways to count these lattice paths that stay above the diagonal is by the Catalan numbers. So 1 over n plus 1 times 2 entries n. 
I'm not going to go into the details about why that's true, but I do think the fact that there's this nice connection to Catalan numbers is one of the reasons why we like parking functions, because beautiful numbers show up. And whenever you see beautiful numbers showing up, it makes you say, oh, this is connected to other things. And the more something is connected, the more interesting it becomes, because you can tie it to other ideas. And the more ideas you can tie something to, the more interesting things are. Okay, well, hmm, how do we take that idea and translate it into trees? Well, you have to be careful. You see, it is true that a similar idea holds for trees. Now, what do I mean by a similar idea? It says the following. Look, take any vertex, and let's say we start here. There's at least one car that has to prefer the leaf. We said that before. But now, suppose I start here at three. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take anything that can reach three. So there we go, there's everything that can reach three. And what has to be true? Well, what has to be true is if I'm looking at this, we'll call it a subtree here, the small part of the big tree. And I wanna ask the question, well, in this subtree, how can I park in there? And the answer is the only way I can park inside that part is to begin inside of that part. And therefore, if I look collectively at the preferences, at least three cars have to prefer the one, two, and three spots. If there's any less, then there will only be two or one or zero cars available to park in those three spots. And that means we're gonna have an empty spot. And that's true for everything. So again, the key is look at the subtrees. But now we run into a problem. You see, before when we had paths, there was this natural progression we could talk about, things moving. But now we don't have that. And so we don't have our nice connection to lattice paths. Okay, so new idea. The trees are really nice though. In, indeed, what we can think of is we don't really have a tree, we have something even nicer, a rooted tree. And how do rooted trees work? Well, the idea here is I can think of the way a rooted tree works is I'm connecting it. So here's my, my bottom root. I can think of it as being connected to a, a set of smaller trees. And lo and behold, I can think of each one of these as also being its own rooted tree. Namely, wherever I connect, I can think of that as being its own root. So it's like, well, maybe if I can figure out what's happening to park in that small tree, and then what's happening to park in that small tree, and so forth and so on. And if I can merge all this information together, maybe, maybe there's enough. Enough information to figure out how many ways there are to park. Maybe. Okay. Well, let's think about it. So, let's start with a special case. So let's look at the following. So I'm gonna call P of T the number of ways to park in a tree. In other words, it's what we're trying to find. Perfect, perfect. And I'm just gonna have my tree consist of something. I have a root here and two subtrees. If we can figure this out, we're gonna make progress. Now, here's the important idea, or rather, if you'd like to say, the important question. Okay, everybody has to have somewhere to park. So the, the real important question is, who parks here? Now, by that, what I really wanna say is, where did this car come from? Now, there's three possibilities. What are they? Well, namely, maybe there's a car that preferred the route, in which case, the car that parks there is the, the car that really liked to park there. They always wanted to park right near the exit. Or it could be the case that it came from T1. In other words, that a car came down and traveled and ended up down there. Or it could be the case a car came from T2, traveled and came down there. So once we can figure that out, well, then we're, we can figure out what's going on. So let's start with the route. Okay, so what do we have? Well. If there's some car that prefers the root, that means nothing came out of those trees, 
which means that what do we have? Well, we just have to say, let's fill in those trees. So P of T1, P of T2. All right, so that's going to be the answer to the root. But now we run into the uh, problem. What if a, the car that ends up at the root came out of T1? Hmm, that is a problem. Now, why is it a problem? Well, because this parking function count here says nothing left. There were no excess cars. But I want to know one excess car. So let's create something. Let's create something that we'll call this P1, where 1 means one more car. So P1 of T equals number of ways to park. So by that, I want all the vertices filled and an excess of one. In other words, one car got frustrated and exited it out of that subtree. So if we think about this, we can think of this as really P0. So we have a zero and a zero. Now we say, okay, great. So we say, all right, so what do we have? Well, if it came from T1, that says I need to say how many ways where if there's one extra car from T1, no extra cars from T2, so P0 of T2. But of course, I could do the opposite, which is no extra car from T1, and whoop, one extra car from T2. Oh, I'm almost off the screen, sorry about that. Okay, there we go, barely made it, all right. Now, at this point, you're probably thinking, wow. So in order to count what we want, we now gotta double our work because I need to count both number of ways to have everything filled and the number of ways to ever have everything filled and have one more left over. But wait, it gets more interesting because what could happen? What if we had this going on? Okay, we could. What's the thing? Well, now the question is who parks in these two slots? They could come from some combination. So for example, two excess cars could come out of T1, not just one. So it's not enough just to know P1, I need to know P2. But wait a second, it gets more interesting. What if I had three things? Now there's three excess cars that I may have to account for. In fact, in general, I could have any number of vertices down here, which means this is getting a little bit more dicey. Our workload is getting larger and larger. And at this point, you can justifiably say, this sounds like a terrible approach. Because we are now saying, we've got to figure out no excess cars, one excess car, two excess cars, any number of excess cars. So we've transformed our problem from instead of trying to find one thing, infinitely many which sounds like it's going to be infinitely harder. Okay, it sounds that way. But there's an interesting thing that happens. And if you only remember one thing from the talk today, and I hope you remember more than one, but if you only remember one, it's important to remember the following. Namely, sometimes it's easier to do more. And it seems so counterintuitive. Our natural instinct in mathematics is to say, let's do as little as possible. In other words, let's make ourselves happy and make life easy for us. Because I think that's a, a really justifiable thing to do. How can we make our life easy? But it turns out that sometimes by doing more, we can actually make things simpler. And we'll demonstrate by the time we get to the end. Okay, so in general, what are we after? Well, we're after the following. PI of T, which is the number of ways to fill the vertices of T and I cars exit. So I everything is filled, but then there's an excess. Okay, so here's our basic picture. So I have my root down here, and I have these K trees there. Now, the big idea is to understand the following statement. Namely, if I want to count the number of ways to have n cars exiting from the tree, it's this expression. So 
we're going to have to digest this for just a little while. But don't worry, by the time we get there, I think we'll be happy. All right, so we have the sum, j equals 0 to n plus 1. Now you might say, well, what is j? So here's the key. So j is equal to the number of excess cars from the subtrees, right? So in other words, I, I have those trees that are up above, so I have cars coming down. So how many cars can come down? Well, maybe I don't have any excess cars. That's perfectly fine. Or maybe I have one or two. What's the most? Well, remember, there's only one spot here available, and any car that doesn't park has to exit. And I want n cars to exit. That's what the n is. If I had n plus 2 come down, I'd have to have at least n plus 1 exit. Well, that doesn't work at all. So that's why we're going from 0 to n plus 1. Okay, so that's what the j is. Now, the next thing. We have this sum. m1, mk, uh, part, sorry, composition of j. So this is what this strange notation means. Now, what does a, a composition mean? Well, so in particular, what this notation means is the following. We have that m1 plus up to mk is equal to j. So in other words, what we've done is we've broken j into parts. And we have that all of these m sub l's are greater than or equal to 0. So none of them are negative. So what should we think of this? Well, so we had j cars coming down. The question is, where do they come down from? So, all right, we're going to say there's some number that came from the first tree. That number is m1. Some number that came from the second tree, that's m2, and so forth and so on. Some number from the last tree, that's mk. And if you added all those together, you'd get j cars, because we're j cars that come down. All right, now, the last part. OK, so now we understand what's happening here. What, how do we figure this out? Well, now that I know how many excess cars there were in each tree, I can say, OK, given that I'm in this situation, how many ways are there to park? Well, I have to fill up each tree. And on the ith tree, I have to have m sub i cars come out. So that's why you have this subscript p m sub i t sub i. And of course, whatever you do in one tree is independent of the other. And so you take the product. And that's the idea. That's the idea. It takes a while to digest it, but it's possible to understand it. OK, now this so far has not been our, wait, it's easier to do more. We need one more key ingredient. The last key ingredient we need, and this is a wonderful thing, oh, one of the best things. It's called generating functions. Now, what are generating functions? They're a way to sort of store information in a compact form. And so in particular, what you should think of is that our, our information that's being stored come in as coefficients. And the way we store it is coefficients of a polynomial. Of course, most of the time when we talk about generating functions, we're dealing with infinite polynomials. So we're really talking about series. So I guess you could say it's time for us to get series. All right. So we're going to come up with a function. We're going to call it p, of course, p for parking, t of x. So t is our tree. So what is it? Well, it's the sum where we're looking at the coefficient of the x to the l is the number of ways to park cars in our tree with l cars exiting. And remember, we were only after the number of ways to park where no cars exited. So we really just wanted p0. And then we said, well, let's throw in all this other stuff as well. And hopefully things will go pretty quick. All right. Well, when you're dealing with generating functions, you should start by saying, well, let's write down at least one, right? Can we do one? And here's our simple case. You should always have a base case to build off of. Suppose our tree was a single vertex. So this is a dot that really represents a single vertex. Well, how many ways are there to park on that vertex and have some number of cars exit? The answer is one, always one. Because what's going to happen is you really only have one type of preference. Your preferences look like I prefer 
this vertex, this vertex, this vertex, this vertex. You know, all the cars prefer the same vertex because there's only one vertex to prefer. And then you just have to say, well, how many cars are there? And the, the number comes out. So when we transform that into our generating function, what do you get? Well, we replace our, our coefficient is now one. So that's the sum from zero to infinity of what? One times x to the l. Well, hmm, that looks familiar. That might be something you may have encountered before, like for example, in a calculus class. That has a name. It's not just any interesting function. This is called the geometric sum, and it's one over one minus x. Okay, so we now have our generating function for one small tree. The next thing to do is say, okay, how do we translate and get our generating function by combining things, right? See, we need something to start building, and then we need to have ways to combine. And once we have that, we're good. We're good. Okay, so I'm going to skip a couple of details here, but not too many. Here's the key idea. Let's think about where pieces are coming from. All right, so we'll start with this inner layer. See, this is sort of like an onion problem. I know an onion problem has layers. And of course, by the time you finish an onion, there might be a couple of tears involved. So if we start here, this piece and only this piece here, what does that look like? Well, what you're doing is you're grabbing coefficients. And so when you're multiplying polynomials together, how do you multiply polynomials together? The answer is you grab all possible combinations of coefficients. If I want a power, say, x to the j power, well, what I do is I grab the coefficients of things so that their powers sum up to j. Well, that's what this is doing. This is summing up to j. And then I multiply the corresponding coefficients together in all possible ways. So this piece right here, that's actually very easy to translate into. So this part is looking like, if I didn't have anything else, I'd say, aha, this would be what would happen if you were to multiply the generating functions of the subtrees together. All right, so far, so good. Now, that's just the next part. We gotta go to our next layer, working our way through our onion. Okay, so the next thing says, hey, hold on a second. I want to add up from zero to n plus one. So what am I doing there? Well, it's what's happening is suppose I have my generating function. I might have a zero plus a one x plus a two x squared, a three x cubed, so forth and so on. And what I want to do is I, I, I want to somehow get to where I'm adding up coefficients. So what does that mean? Well, it'd be like a zero plus a zero plus a one x, sorry, ah, plus a zero plus a one plus a two x squared, plus so forth and so on. So in other words, I want to combine coefficients. Now, the way we do this, this is, this is fun. The way this is done is to say, aha, multiply. Multiply by what? Well, the answer is we're going to multiply by a really good choice of our series. Namely, the series 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus so forth. If you multiply these series together, that's the result. So you can check the constant, a0. What about the x term? Then you have here a0 plus a1. How about the x squared term? a0 plus a1 plus a2, and so forth and so on. But we know this. We've seen it before. This is 1 over 1 minus x. Okay, progress, progress. So here, I'm going to lie a little bit, but I'm going to correct my lie in just a second. When we go to the next layer, it's like... 1 over 1 minus x times p t1 of x up to p t k of x. All right. Now, I said I lied, but I want to correct my lie. Where's my lie and where's my correction? My lie is it's not quite right. 
And here's sort of a, a small subtle thing. I'd be perfectly fine except for this plus one. See, if it only went from zero to n, I'm done. But it went from zero to n plus one. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that if I look at this expression here, in other words, a generating function, and what does it look like? Well, it looks like I'll say there's some constant term, there's some b1x, there's b2x squared, there's b3x cubed, so forth and so on. That's what I currently have if I were just to stop right there. But it's not quite right. Because of this n plus 1, what I really want is this coefficient for b1. That's what I want to be in the constant. So I somehow want to go from here to saying, well, I want b1 plus b2x plus b3x squared and so forth. So that's where I want to get to. So how do I get there? And the answer is pretty easy, actually. I need to do sort of a shift, and I do the shift in two ways. I'm going to get rid of my constant term, that b0, and then once I got rid of it, everything has an x, so I divide by x. So how do we get rid of the constant term? Well, that's actually super easy. The way you get rid of a constant term is you just say, what's the constant, and subtract it. So in our case, our constant would be plug in x equals 0. See, if you plugged in x equals 0, all the last part drops out except the b0. Well, here you get 1 over 1. OK. So then you subtract p t1 of 0, dot, 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 p t k of 0. Okay. So there is I subtracted off the constant term. And then I multiply it by 1 over x to do my shift. OK. And that's it. And what, what's happened here? Well, lo and behold, we've now been able to take information about the subtrees and produce the right generating function for the big tree. So the punchline is that we can now take our generating functions and we have our building tool. And that's our tool. That's what takes us to say if we have our subtrees, we can get our tree that we're after. That's the idea. Okay, all right. Now, what should we say? Well, the process now is actually pretty simple. What we do is we have our generating function for our base case and ways to combine our trees together, our subtrees, so we can build up trees. So now we can find any large tree we want relatively quickly. Like I said, 1,000 vertices, yeah, we can do that, no problem. That might take us 15 seconds. But that's really short, considering how many possibilities there are. Now, what are some things you might want to do? Well, one of the things is we've been focusing on the unordered variation. In other words, we don't care what order of the preferences there are. If we did, can we, can we do something similar? And the answer is yes. But we have to use a different type of generating function. The type of function we've been doing so far is called ordinary generating function. It's a type of generating function you might see just casually walking around. It's like, hey, there's an ordinary generating function over there. The other type of generating function that you might encounter is called an exponential generating function. And the exponential generating function helps you to count things where order matters. Now, you might discover, now that we have ways to count, that some trees have really nice counts. And there's an example of this. It's called a caterpillar. Now, if you're not familiar with what a caterpillar is, if you see the picture, then you have a pretty good idea. So what you do is you start with a path. So there's a path, and this will be our root. So here's our root. I'll just mark it there. And a caterpillar just says, make your path fuzzy. So you can add leaves on to as many leaves as you want to any vertex. You don't have to have any leaves you want. So that's what a caterpillar is. Now, how does it have a nice count? It turns out that it's connected to lattice paths. So lo and behold, there is a connection to lattice paths if you use the right kind of tree. Now, there's even more that can be done. There's something called the Q analog, which in this case counts, well, how many times do you have to look at, say, a car gets bumped? 
In other words, it gets to the spot it wanted. Oh, nope, not available. So it goes to the next one and the next one and the next one. And then you can keep track of that. That's a statistic. You can actually use generate functions to help count that as well. So there's a lot more that can be done. And of course, as always, there's more to be understood. So for example, suppose I, I have a tree. Well, where should I put the root? You see, I can put a root at any vertex, not just there. I can put a root anywhere. Which root gives the most parking function? Well, probably somewhere near the end. But which end? Which one gives the least? Are things going to behave in a nice way? It's not so clear. Not so clear. A lot more to understand. But that's good. It's good to have problems. And it's good to keep going. All right. Thank you for staying here until the end. And if you want to know more, you can read the paper about parking distribution on trees. It's available online, and I hope you learned something.